Thanks so much as always, Erica. And uh, thank you, Scott, for joining me here again. I'm going to turn it right over to you. For, for those of you that have already dialed in, we're going to keep today uh, a bit over, you know, right around 30, 30 to 40 minutes, not one of our really long ones, but we'll cover everything we need to. Send in questions, like Erica said, questions at thebonsongroup.com. My partner, Dea, is live just sitting there grabbing your emails and um, and sending them over to Scott as they come in. Um, so, you know, Scott, I know you got a few things to drive us through here and uh, I'm at your beck and call. Let's talk markets. All right, David, let's do it. Great to be with you as always. And yes, we've actually already been getting some great questions, which we'll get to in a moment. But I think, David, as we always do on these calls, just starting off with your broader temperature on where things stand in the markets right now, what do you think is the biggest story in markets right now? Is it stimulus, interest rates, earnings, a combination of all three? Um, in the, like a real immediate short term, it, it is bond yields um, moving higher. And I want to kind of make a clarification uh, that some may not even agree with just in my vernacular, but like the interest rates versus bond yields, they're kind of one and the same, but they're a little bit different in the sense that I think most people do refer to interest rates as like the some relevant borrowing rate. And, and the Fed funds rate is not going higher. It, it hasn't gone higher. It's not going to go higher for, for a long time. So really, we kind of are talking about bond yields, which, of course, are interest rates. But it's the longer end of the curve that's moved a bit. And so to put that into perspective, we're talking about a 10-year that has gone to 1.3% from about 1%. And we're talking about a 30 year that has gone from about 1.5 to uh, 2%, okay? A little over two. So you do have the longer uh, bond yields at a higher level here. And a lot of that's been going on for a few months. It's kind of moved you know, more basis points higher in the last few weeks financials have all made new highs. I don't just mean back to, uh, uh, you know, post COVID highs, but I mean higher than they were pre COVID. Okay. So that's a really important development that the, the uh, areas of the market that were hurt by a very flat yield curve um, now have benefited from that steeper yield curve and a lot of other fundamental things that have gone into their positioning. But when we talk about interest rates, uh, you, you, you start hearing people say, okay, well, bond yields going higher means higher inflation. I think that's probably a separate conversation and one I, I'd want to look at a bit differently than just the mere movement of, of bond yields in recent weeks that has, to some degree, kind of impacted uh, different sectors of the stock market. And and David, I think uh, you know to your point. Uh, I, I guess the the year to date change in interest rates is is pretty sizable from a percentage standpoint, or however you want to measure it. But we're still talking about pretty low bond yields, just e even on a year over year basis or on a historical basis, right? Yeah. So there's all this this uh, discussion in my world about what's the level of the ten year that starts drawing people out of stocks into bonds. And, and Maria Bartiroma asked me that question on Fox Business this morning. And I, and I said to her, I thought it was kind of laughable to think that we're talking about actually pulling investors out because they didn't like bonds at 1%, but they really like them at 1.3%. The difference is not that it's going to pull flows from stocks to bonds. It's that it re-rates the value of stocks, that it, it, uh, on, on certain multiples or valuations, the competitive rate to bonds has a re-rating effect. And I think the valuation argument's legitimate. I don't think that the flow argument is, but it becomes more compelling if the tenure were to pass 2%. And I think the magic number is probably about two and a half, which is roughly double where the yield is right now. And I just frankly don't think it's going to happen. Um, but I agree. I think that there's some question as to how we want to understand these things on absolute basis as opposed to relative basis. And, and, and to your point, we can talk about how the tenure is 30% higher, but when it's from 1 to 1 1.3, 
that's a lot different than if the tenure had been at four percent and all of a sudden it got to you know five and a half percent. You see what I'm saying? That the the numbers in small uh, a small starting spot are very different. And you you bring up a great point about flows because I, I remember that issue coming up back in 2015 2016 when when the Fed was first raising interest rates after keeping them near zero since the financial crisis. And that fear of, of flows out of stocks never really materialized, you know, in, in that era of the Fed. It doesn't mean it won't materialize in, in this era, but I guess we, we've been down this road before. Yeah, but one of the things that will help people to get the story right about flows, and it would have helped the media to get it right, is if they understood that flows never went down when even when rates and yields were very low. The one thing that's been very consistent since the great financial crisis is hundreds of billions of dollars of flows into short-term bond funds, whether it's ETFs or mutual funds. So flows didn't go reverse when yields were really low. And inversely, there's no reason to think that they would change uh, when yields go higher. Flows have just been good into bonds because they're highly liquid asset class and people have needed that sort of liquidity and money market substitute uh, throughout their portfolios. And they've mostly kind of gotten away with it. Um, now, it's funny, you were talking about the Fed. If you recall, the Fed raised rates in 2015 just once at the end of the year, a quarter point, and then didn't raise in 2016 um, until after the election, after telegraphing that they were going to raise four times. What I think was making a difference then, and then we're talking about real interest rates. You're talking about the real Fed funds rate, the real short-term borrowing rate that the prime rate works off of, that LIBOR works off of, that mortgage rates work off of. This is a very actionable interest rate in the economy. And at that point, what you saw was a dollar strengthen like crazy. And you had a lot of flows out of emerging markets. You had a lot of flows out of uh, developed international. And the expectation was built in of a hawkish Fed strengthening the dollar, and then having an impact throughout capital markets that still didn't really end up hurting the stock market for more than about a month or two in early 2016. Um, my belief is that that's the furthest thing from my expectation right now. The 10-year the, the and 30-year are acting in concert with growth expectations around an economy that was shut down and then is now less shut down and will someday not be shut down at all. And that someday is coming quicker than people have thought. I think the 10 year and 30 year are pricing in growth, but that the short term aspect is still very much anchored to zero bound because of Fed intervention. I, I guess our, our last point on, on this topic uh, pertains to something somebody wrote in uh, and we kind of addressed this already, but I, I just love their question. They write, with interest rates on the rise, causing the TINA effect to weaken, what will be the impact on dividend growth paying stocks? A TINA, of course, being there is no alternative. Well, as I've talked about quite a bit, I don't believe that the greatest impact of uh, potentially higher rates um, is on dividend growth stocks, uh, the, especially with those that kind of traded a more reasonable and historical level of market multiple. I think it's primarily on those stocks that have a higher um, valuation, a higher PE ratio, things like that, because then the slightest bit of re-rating has a disproportionate impact to their price as a result of valuation. Um, this is where yield spread becomes important. I, I assume, I don't know this, but I assume what might be embedded in the presupposition of the question is that if dividend stocks were yielding, let's say, 4.5% and the 10-year was at 1, and now the 10-year is at 1.5, doesn't that mean that there's a little bit of difference in the yield available that starts to make the dividend stocks less attractive? But see, as we just talked about on a relative basis, I don't think there's anyone who likes a 350 basis point spread that doesn't also like a 300 basis point spread. In other words, um, uh, a good diversified portfolio of dividend growth stocks that has a yield at a wide premium to the S&P 500 or to the 10-year 
has a lot of built-in cushion against some of the movements with rates. And of course, that's the whole point of dividend growth is we're not stuck at a fixated yield. The actual absolute level of income grows from the organic free cash flow growth of the companies. And for people who are, are familiar with, with your work and who are watching this call and who have watched past calls, they, they probably know this already, but for anyone new tuning in, you know, the, the dividend growth stocks, David, that you, you invest in, that you talk a lot about, have a 30, 40, 50 year history of dividend growth. I mean, that's a pretty long span where we're going to have, you know, crises during those decades. We're going to have times of rising bond yields, falling bond yields. I, I guess, would you separate uh, the whole dividend growth idea from whatever bond yields are doing? Well, totally and completely. The only um, thing that I think is important is that over time in a secular rate environment, there's no question that the um, a lower yield or a higher yield kind of becomes an anchor to where you know these companies are competing against. So if like throughout the society we had an extended period of time of a five year, um, excuse me, a five percent ten year bond yield, then then these companies have to kind of price their dividend in concert with that higher rate expectation. And, and what I think has happened over the last 15 years is now a company can pay a 4% yield that previously would have been somewhat uh, mundane. And, and right now it's over two times higher than the S&P or than the 10 year. So you do get a kind of anchoring effect over time. But, but your point is the far more important one, which is the ability of these companies to just continually grow the dividend regardless of where we are in a rate cycle, where we are in an economic cycle. Um, and of course, not every company in our dividend portfolio has that 30, 40, 50 year history because some of them are newer companies and things like that. But let me give you an example without saying the name of the company that I, I kind of talk about in um, my weekly portfolio report that goes out to clients that uh, is gonna, it's gonna come out on Wednesday, but I wrote it over the weekend. Um, this company has grown their dividend for 50 something years now. It's a really large blue chip household name, but it is going to um, pay out $1 and 68 cents in dividends this year. In 1986, uh, as I was getting ready to enter high school, it paid out a dollar six, excuse me, the, the stock price was a dollar 68 adjusted for splits. Okay, so in the course of time since I began high school, the company is now paying out 100% cash on cash every year, and the stock price is up 3,000% over 35-year period. Um, I, I don't bring this up because it's an exception to the rule. I bring it up because it's the rule when you get the math of consistent dividend growth over time. Uh, now, not everyone has a 35-year timeline, and there's all kinds of other things that have to play in, like the sustainability of that dividend, the durability of the company and so forth. But my point is that th these types of things, those stories and a whole lot of other companies and, and, and cultures, business commitments that, that are involved in the landscape of what we're trying to do, those things are far more powerful than, than ups and downs of bond yields. And I think this speaks to one of the great arguments for dividend growth is that you are going to have transitory economic things. I don't know that anyone could have guessed that the bond yields in the 70s were going to get as high as they got or that the bond yields right now would get as low as they got. But certainly we all know that there's going to be cyclical realities to any economy. And I think that of all the different things that go up and down in good times, bad times, the ability to have one of the most important things in our financial lives not go down mainly cash flow from our portfolio, these dividends, I think is a really uh, stabilizing force in the way we think about our own financial management. And, and let's now talk, David, about, uh, I guess, the other side of the coin, because when we talk about, you know, the 10-year Treasury yield signaling economic growth or some sort of optimism post-COVID, uh, we should also bring up a couple of risks with that. So one is pent up demand, rising inflation. And then later on, we did get a question about 
your take on rising debt levels. So maybe we can talk about that as well. But let's start with, with rising inflation and kind of what risks you see there. Well, for any who read uh, Dividend Cafe in, in recent times, um, I make a very important, particularly this last Friday, I make a very important distinction um, between pent-up demand um, and, and inflation. Um, there is a demand component that can become inflationary. Uh, inflationary simply means that there is a greater amount of money than there are goods and services. In theory, if demand is organically and naturally growing, um, the goods and services available to meet that demand grow, and that is growthy, but it is not inflationary. It's an example of a productive growth. And so I think the distinction between productive growth and non-productive growth, between a growth of money supply that is not being met with goods and services to soak it up versus what I think we're, we're dealing with now is, is a really important distinction. But let's separate out the inflation discussion for a second, talk about the pent-up demand, talk about just that economic growth thesis. Um, I am very much on uh, the side of those who do believe that we have a lot of pent-up demand in the economy, that there is a lot of slack, that um, it represents the difference between our potential output and our actual output, and that that slack is going to get met, that it's go that we're going to see that GDP growth increase. And the reason is that we have a whole lot of folks in the economy that have not been taking vacations or going out to eat or other things that play into economic inputs, and that they're about to start doing it. And in some cases, they're going to do it uh, like, like on steroids, you know, a bigger vacation, an extra vacation, more consumption, to reward themselves out coming out of this just sort of insane period we've been in for about 11 months now. Uh, as I wrote about though in our white paper at the beginning of the year, my question's not about the kind of um, wait and see moment we're in now in the economy or the pent up demand phase that I'm forecasting we go and do from there. My question is after that. It's more, you know, six months out, nine months out, 12 months out that um, when we've already kind of exhausted the discussion of the COVID uh, contraction and then the COVID recovery, and we're just sort of in a non-COVID discussion about the economy, I think that's a much more um, open-ended question and, and has a lot more uh, uncertainty around it than we have right now. But as far as the immediate outlook, um, I would take the um, under, on anyone wondering, you know, when the economy is going to be more fully reopened and when and when day-to-day uh, -day living is going to be more normal, I think that the um, uh, declining COVID metrics and the success of vaccine distribution and the psychology of the population right now is all heavily biased towards sooner than later economic reopening. Um, and then with that, David, uh, we, we know we've got a lot of debt. Uh, we know we're about to get another potentially $2 trillion stimulus package adding to that debt. But then as we talked about at the top of the call, interest rates are low. So perhaps the, the cost of carrying that debt uh, is pretty low. But I, I guess, how are you viewing our national debt right now from an investment point of view? Uh, and, and are there any economic implications as well? Yeah, I mean, this is much more of a secular question than it is anything cyclical or transitory. We do not have um, high levels of national debt merely because of, of COVID and the, and the bills that were associated with it. If there had been no COVID, we still had a $21 trillion national debt with a pretty fierce commitment to running another trillion dollar budget deficit last year. And, and so regardless of what would have or, or whatnot around the election, uh, what party is in and so forth, there seems to right now be a bipartisan national appetite for some level of trillion dollar deficits and in the COVID moment, obviously even higher. And that's on top of what is far uh, well over 20 trillion in national debt. And the economy is not growing at the same rate that the, the debt is. And, and as the debt gets added, you're getting a diminishing return from the debt, um, which is what you expect. And, and so that I think this becomes a really important claim on future growth. 
And so in a secular sense, whether we're talking about with COVID or without, the um, overall debt levels become a very negative story for economic growth. Um, but because of the way we're choosing to treat that, which is with a whole bunch of monetary stimulus, it becomes a, it has so far become a um, positive story for asset prices because it has led them to try to meet the burden of the debt with more stimulative and accommodative monetary policy which primes the pump of credit and lowers the cost of capital, which then increases um, the valuation um, as the risk-free rate goes down to effectively zero. This has been the case at different degrees ever since the great financial crisis, and now it's the case on steroids. So I think that you have that tale of two cities, which has, by the way, a lot of cultural or, or social implications as well, certainly political ones, but, but economically, it's not at all inconsistent to believe that you get um, a, a slower growth in the economy long-term as a result of what the, this is, and at the same time, in, in the short to intermediate term, um, a boost into risk asset prices. The only precedent that we have is a, not a perfect one, and that's the country of Japan, the reason I say not a perfect one is there are a lot of demographic differences and a lot of um, economic differences in our two countries. But my view is that um, the, the debt level is not going to decrease. Uh, there is no um, appetite to, to change that trajectory. All they can maybe do is buy themselves some time and that we're gonna live throughout uh, the next couple of decades and it really could be longer um, trying to treat this and slow it down and play with it and experiment with it with varying um, degrees of monetary policy. And so we live in a great period of uncertainty around uh, central bank experimentation. And um, that's sort of been my outlook for some time. And it's something I'm pretty much dedicating the rest of my adult life to studying and understanding. So, well, that that is... Uh... Secular, uh, you weren't kidding when you said secular. Um, what do you do then? I mean, is there is is it TBD in terms of what you do from an investing point of view? Uh, is it just kind of continue on as has been the case? Or do you think you'll start to see some changes in how we invest because of the national debt? I guess, when do those two worlds collide? No, I think that you're, they're colliding now and it's uh, the dividend cafes that um, have come out so far this year have all kind of centered around some version of this story. And, and it, it brings me back to my really strong belief in trying to neutralize the deflation inflation debate and the debt debate, the Japanification story by focusing on bottom up operating performances and free cash flow growth that comes out of companies with pricing power. And so you can actually, I think, reasonably insulate yourself from a lot of these things, um, as opposed to what a lot of investors are trying to do, which is, is take a view as to what is going to happen and, and have a very thematic portfolio around it. And, and I would be opposed to that strategy because I believe that most people will take a view that is wrong or they will um, execute on their view in the wrong way. And I don't think that it is the best risk adjusted solution to try to forecast economic growth in light of these uh, circumstances, inflation, deflation, in light of these circumstances. And, and like I said, you don't have to be right just once, you have to be right twice. You have to be right about what inflation is gonna do, and then you have to be right about how certain investment strategies will respond to that. And I can't tell you how many people have gotten that wrong. You know, the, the um, entire phenomena around gold out of the 1970s is largely a story of people believing that they were going to debase the currency. And, and more or less, we lived, it's true, we moderated inflation to some degree, but obviously inflation didn't go away. And yet um, gold as a, per, as a strategy to combat inflation woefully underperformed for the better part of 40 years. And I think, and I think that um, some of the stuff I read from really, I consider some of the greatest macroeconomists in my Rolodex 
um, I just believe they're pretty much right on a whole lot of their macro themes they're following. But then when they apply it into what one ought to do, I'm really skeptical. I mean, maybe 50-50 chance, but you know, there's a big thesis right now about buying um, Asian sovereign debt, that buying Chinese government bonds or, or even uh, Asian denominated currency, that that's going to combat against some of the stuff we're talking about in the U.S., but I can't even begin to list how many things could go wrong with that thesis. And just on a risk adjusted basis, not only is it, by the way, boring as hell, but it, um, it, it's not to me the most stable way to deliver a consistency around either one's accumulation of wealth goals or their delivery of cash flow, their return of capital goals. So I'm not trying to just talk my book here. I'm trying to explain where my book came from and I don't mean my physical book, but the, you know, the way that we manage money, um, dividend growth uh, it ought to be a pretty neutral way to be positioned around this stuff. And the key phrase in this is pricing power. Uh, overly indebted um, companies can't be reliable dividend growers. So we have to avoid that kind of thing. And overly indebted countries um, the, the companies that have pricing power can kind of remove themselves from some of those uh, concerns. That's, that's the thesis that I'm trying to give in a few minutes to what is really a, a few decade type, um, you know, challenge. Well, and, and I'll, I'll just complete that thought for you, David, because you have your investing book for clients, but you actually also do have a book, a real book about all about dividend growth and, and your philosophy there. Yeah, and that and that book was written um, before before COVID. I wouldn't change a single word of it um, right now uh, in in the COVID moment. Um, and the changes in national debt, changes in budget deficits, uh, bond yields are are different. You know, the the kind of transitory realities of a global economy um, have played out in a couple of years since I wrote wrote the book, and they will continue to. But um, fortunately for me, I intentionally wrote the book around evergreen principles. And, and, and fortunately for the Bonson Group, our investment committee has put together investment strategies that are based on evergreen type principles. And so right now, I really am, am always, I mean, look, we write a daily market piece, the DC Today, because I have so much um, conviction around what my responsibility is to be studying things in real time and understanding things and, and where necessary repositioning. But as far as the underlying principles of how to uh, uh, obtain a return on capital, um, I really do believe that that book and, and the philosophies that we've formulated over many years represent the right solution for our clients. If we move to the end of our discussion here, David, uh, What's going on in Texas? We'll shift gears a little bit. Um, your reaction there with, with uh, the, the weather conditions there, uh, it's getting a lot of attention. Uh, I, I guess any energy sector implications or, or, or any thoughts there? Well, um, you know, some utility names are, are uh, distressed as a result of what's taken place and, and some commodity prices and companies levered to commodity prices have done very well from out of it. Similar to the, the whole point I sort of just got done making, I would never want to, to base an investment view on a one week news event, you know, whether it's natural disasters, weather events, often geopolitical events, these are the kind of things that are really important in the news cycle, but tend to not be very important in the in a even intermediate term of one's portfolio. But um, I certainly believe that this does point to a lot of issues in the commodity cycle um, and in the need for the infrastructure necessary to deliver on a coherent national energy policy. And I suspect that, uh, look, the, the idea, I don't think a lot of people, I, th I can't remember who I heard say it, but there's not a lot of people preparing for earthquakes in, in Chicago and you don't generally think of the type of freezing winter conditions that they had last week in, in Austin, Texas. It, it gets very cold, but um, the types of, of snowstorms that they endured last week 
and, uh, are usually reserved for other parts of the country. And so I believe that out of these events tend to come uh, the necessary adjustments in policy um, and preparation to try to deal with it better the next time. But from an investment standpoint, um, no, I do not believe that uh, one ought to be going out and selling a whole bunch of one thing or buying a whole bunch of another. I just hope it reinforces what was very true before last week as well, which is that we have a need for more investment into energy infrastructure uh, and the ability to deliver natural gas safely um, and consistently is best done through pipelines. And uh, we, we need more pipelines, not less to be able to do that. And, and, I, and I'm right now not even referring to crude oil, I'm referring to, to natural gas, which is uh, something that has all the economic upside of being able to be exported to a lot of places around the world. And so I, I'm not presenting this as a new theme for us. You could go back to stuff I was writing on this in 2013, 2014. Um, I believe in pretty strongly that whether it's ports, terminals, um, you know, production capacity um, at the rigs and wells, and then certainly pipelines taking things away, um, I believe that we just need uh, more and better infrastructure. Uh, David, we talked a lot about interest rates and bond yields at the top of our discussion. We, we are getting a question right now about that. So I just want to go back to that for a moment. Somebody writes in, uh, given the, the current steepening of the yield curve, even though rates are still pretty low, would you consider mortgage REITs relatively more or less attractive right now? Um, more, more attractive, although uh, they've already had a heck of a run recovering post COVID. Um, it's something that we implement in our income enhancement strategy and, and use a particular best of breed mortgage REIT that survived, a lot of them didn't survive. You know, they're very levered vehicles and many just got you know, basically murdered during the COVID period last, last spring. Um, but we, we took a position in a best of breed mortgage REIT, but only in the income enhancement. You know, you're not gonna get growth of income, but you're gonna get high income and where someone's willing to use some of their risk budget into that yield premium we, we like it there, um, and certainly in a period of, of yield curve steepening, you get, you get a leverage effect in that upside, um, but the, it comes with corresponding risk. There's no free lunch. Uh, David, give us a, a preview of what's coming up uh, in DC today, which is your daily market commentary that comes out at about six o'clock Eastern every day. Yeah, I got, I got a few hours to wrap it up, but actually, um, the Monday one is always a little easier because I generally do spend some time on it over the weekend. And this weekend was no exception because I was uh, traveling to New York City on Saturday and then was in the city by myself on, on Sunday. And, and so I kind of have a little bit of a head start coming into Monday morning. Um, and so there is some extra information around COVID. A lot of time spent in the last couple of days just analyzing some updated numbers, some vaccine data, some really quite staggering information around some of the, the new strains. And, and, and I just have a very optimistic uh, bend right now on where we are headed. Um, and and I'm, I'm providing the data in DC today to sort of rationalize a lot of that optimism. Uh, but again, from the Fed, to housing and mortgage rates. Um, on the public policy front, there were a couple interesting developments over the weekend. Um, I do think that Neera Tandon's nomination at uh, OMB um, will probably end up being the first and maybe the last, but the first uh, appointment to blow up on the Biden administration. It's not a foregone conclusion. Um, you know, you only have one Democrat senator so far saying he's going to oppose it. I think there might be more out there, um, but if, if they get, are able to sway one Republican, it, it could still survive. But it looks like um, my early forecast when President Biden, when President elect Biden first nominated Ms. Tandon, my forecast then was that she'd end up being the sort of sacrificial lamb that, that I thought was going to be a very tough path to get through. At the time, it was not based on Republican opposition, but it was based on what I thought some of the more progressive opposition to her might be. 
And I still think that that is out there, but it does look like mathematically that this will, will uh, end up going down. And so that is a, a interesting development on the policy front. At the same time that they are preparing to get the stimulus uh, off to the House for its discussion, eventual vote, the Senate parliamentarian is gonna rule, I believe tomorrow, on whether or not to allow the minimum wage increase to be a part of this bill through budget reconciliation. And I can't even imagine that, that the parliamentarian will allow that. Um, but, uh, and then even if he or she does, and forgive me, I just don't know if the Senate parliamentarian is, is a he or she, but either way, you, you are likely to see um, that if, if that is allowed to go through budget reconciliation, then a, a really kind of messy situation because I don't think the votes are going to be there for it. Where apart from that kind of thing, I think the votes are there to get this through on purely partisan ground. And I just can't imagine why they'd want to complicate that. So I think we're a couple of weeks away from seeing 1.7, 1.8, maybe even the full 1.9 trillion of the stimulus bill passed into law. Uh, all of those things are discussed in DC today. All right, David, we'll be looking forward to that. And uh, I'll toss it back to you as we uh, close out today's discussion. Thank you so much for your insights. Well, thanks for guiding us through. And for any of you who had other questions, feel free to send those uh, to questions at thebonsongroup.com and I'll make a point to, to respond back to you personally. And, and um, I think that, you know, right now we're in one of these precarious positions where everyone kind of feels like something should be happening in the market, but it's actually just really done quite well. It's been reasonably steady. Um, and, and I think that most people now are beginning to price in the reality of an economy that's headed towards healthier conditions. But um, as I wrote about in the white paper, my forecast for a better economy this year, but not as good of a market this year relative to last year, I do very strongly suspect that we'll end up having some market volatility that lasts more than a day or two, which we really haven't had for quite some time. Um, but of course, good investors know that they're prepared for it. Right now, I guess the difference is you can kind of identify what you think might be the catalyst for it. Um, but my view is that you never need to identify the catalyst. Markets uh, endure such volatility and even corrections from time to time because they do. And that's just sort of the nature of the beast. But um, look, there might be other things more specific on your mind. Scott allowed us to go through inflation, deflation, debt, bond yields, interest rates today but uh, other categories of things that are on your mind, um, I invite you to reach out. Uh, it's what I'm here to do. So thank you again for participating in the call. 